welcome to the first regular midweek warm up of 2023. Regular scheduled program. <laughs> um, starting <clears throat> off the year right, hopefully getting this out on Wednesday. I don't know what time, but whatever time we choose. I or guess. which Wednesday? <laughs> Wednesday the 4th? Yeah, Wednesday the 1st. Because I can't count. <laughs> um, Anyhow, we hope you all had a great Christmas and New Year's and uh, just wanted to jump into, back into Job again. And um, I guess, do you, want, do you want to give a little overview of what we went over last? I was playing on it. Yeah. Okay. Okay, so go. where we ended up last time is Job was talking about the second coming. And so he doesn't talk about Jesus so much because obviously he hasn't born yet. But he's talking about knowing that there is going to be a second coming and there will be a new life for everyone who believes in God. And that's Job 14. Logically, yes. I'm just giving context. Reference. I appreciate that. <laughs> to you. And so Job is there and he's basically been talking about all the facts of how life is, which... At this point, in retrospect, we can see that those things are pretty much all true. Mm -hmm. And that everything his friends say is wrong. And we're going to continue this week with more of the wrong part of his friends. <laughs> so with that, we're going to be in Job 15 today. And it's Eliphaz the Temanite talking again. Mm -hmm. Not Eliphaz the Termite. <laughs> yeah. Um, and if I recall correctly, Eliphaz is the third of Job's friends to appear. I don't remember this point. And he's the harshest. He's got too many. Or let's just say he has not enough real friends and too many of these guys. <laughs> well, I, I I will preface this chapter with, I think the issue is Eliphaz is seeing what's happening purely from his own perspective and not stopping to pray about or consider what Job is actually saying. So he's responding kind of out of his own wisdom and his own understanding. Mm -hmm. And I think we have a tendency to do that in the present age as well. So um, as much as clearly Eliphaz is very harsh and Job's friends are... Not friendly? <laughs> well, at first... They did well, and then they started they talking. <laughs> um, I just, I think that there's a level of grace we need to remember to have because we can just as easily be Eliphaz or any of the um, Bildad. Bildad, the shoe height, because he's short. Um, <laughs> I mean, it's it's just a matter of, Seeing what they're saying and understanding why it's in scripture, I guess. Yeah. I'll stop ranting now. But in Eliphaz's defense, scripture didn't exist yet, so he couldn't read the Bible and find out for himself. Yeah. So that's why he's there, is to show us to make stupid decisions. <laughs> to not make stupid decisions. No, the, showing to make them so you get made fun of by everyone else. Can be made very easily and even well intentioned, we can make these mistakes. So, Okay, so as always, I'm going to read through it, and then we're going to go verse by verse through it. So here it goes. Then Eliphaz the Temanite answered and said, Should a wise man answer with empty knowledge and fill himself with the east wind? Should he reason with unprofitable talk, or by speeches with which he can do no good? Yes, you cast off fear and restrain prayer before God, for your iniquity teaches your mouth, and you choose the tongue of the crafty. Your own mouth condemns you, and not I. Yes, your own lips testify against you. Are you the first man who was born, or were you made before the hills? Have you heard the counsel of God? Do you limit wisdom to yourself? What do you know that we do not know? What do you understand that is not in us? Both the gray-haired and the aged are among us, much older than your father. Are the constellations of God too small for you, and the word spoken gently with you? Why does your heart carry you away, and what do your eyes wink at? They turn your spirit against God, and let such words go out of your mouth. What is man that he could be pure, and he who is born a woman that he could be righteous? If God puts no trust in his saints, and the heavens are not pure in his sight, how much less man who is bondable and filthy, who drinks iniquity like water? I will tell you, hear me. What I have seen I will declare, what wise men have told, not hiding anything received from their fathers, to whom alone the land was given, and no alien passed among them. 
The wicked man writhes with pain all his days, and the number of years is hidden from the oppressor. Dreadful sounds are in his ears. In prosperity, the destroyer comes upon him. He does not believe that he will return from darkness, for a sword is waiting for him. He wanders about for bread, saying, Where is it? He knows that a day of darkness is ready at his hand. Trouble and anguish make him afraid. They overpower him like a king ready for battle. For he stretches out his hand against God and acts defiantly against the Almighty, running stubbornly against him with his strong embossed shield. Though he has covered his face with fatness and made his waist heavy with fat, he dwells in desolate cities and houses which no one inhabits, which are destined to become ruins. He will not be rich, nor will his wealth continue, nor will his possessions overspread the earth. He will not depart from darkness. The flame will dry out his branches, and by the breath of his mouth he will go away. Let him not trust in futile things, deceiving himself, for futility will be his reward. He will be accomplished before his time, and his branch will not be green. He will shake off his unripe grape like a vine, and cast off his blossom like an olive tree. For the company of hypocrites will be barren, and fire will consume the tents of bribery. They conceive trouble and bring forth futility. Their womb prepares deceit. Yeah, Eliphaz is, again, very harsh. And I think it's clear in several points of what his speech, in his speech, that he was not listening to Job. Because Job flat out says, I'm not righteous. He says, I couldn't. And when he says... I'm righteous before men, but how can I stand before God? Basically. Well, unequivocally is not listening, and he's also plain wrong. But at the same time, he's also what should be right. Because this is what should be occurring. But we know from experience of the last 6,000 years yeah. that this is not what happens. So let's go through it verse by verse, and we'll talk about more about what it is. So obviously verse 1 is kind of obvious because Eliphaz says, big surprise there. So he says, should a wise man answer with empty knowledge and fill himself with the east wind? So he's basically saying, should we spout platitudes and just talk about things? Which it's kind of funny that he says that because that's exactly what he and the other two guys have been saying to Job the entire time is spouting platitudes and not saying useful things. Yeah. Because they're not listening. They're not praying. They're not asking God for wisdom. They're just spouting what sounds good to them because clearly you must get something good if you're good. Well, yeah. They're, they're kind of naming and claiming so. They're functioning in their own wisdom, their own understanding of how God has interacted in the past and who they believe God to be based on that, I guess. Um, well, I think it's more that they're running off of the example that they just came out of the flood and and flood happened just before they were born. So even let's say these guys are old for now, which wouldn't be old then, but still older. Let's say they're maybe 300, which that looks really old to us. That's not necessarily old for that time period. But even if that's it, they still remember, okay, we have us. We have a few dozen friends. Everyone else was dead. And we're still finding bodies because they would be. They have been finding bodies for centuries afterwards in various states of decay. Well, I, w I would think that most of them would have been... A lot of them would be obviously made into oil, which is why we have oil now, and coal. And you're burning dead people. Uh, it's the reality. It's not just dinosaurs. And people. plants. Lots of people. Anyway. But that's what they would have been going through. They would have known that all the bad people are punished. Mm -hmm. But they don't know yet that that's a one-off in history that God wipes out the bad people. Well, that it's funny because when Noah landed, he specifically was told God gave the rainbow as a sign that he would never flood the earth again. Yeah, and they had that to work with. But they're going that this is going to be the standard is that bad guys get killed. And God said, I'm not doing that again. I'm starting over again try and figure it out this time. And he gave the directions of how to figure it out and they just didn't follow them. And so that's where he's coming from now is the historically bad guys are gonna get what's coming to them, which obviously they will, but probably not in this lifetime. But moving on. Should he reason with unprofitable talk or by speeches with which he can do no good? That's exactly what Eliphaz is doing. Yes, you cast off fear and restrain prayer before God, for your iniquity teaches your mouth, and you choose the tongue of the crafty. 
Your own mouth condemns you, and not I. Yes, your own lips testify against you. So he's basically saying here, yeah, you have the right attitude in that you're not quivering and bowing before God and begging for forgiveness and everything. But he's saying that you're doing it from the reason that you are guilty, not saying that you have the grounds to stand before him and say, I'm innocent. Because mm-hmm. obviously Job has the grounds to say, I'm innocent and don't deserve this when he's asking God, which eventually God's going to answer him back. Well, and he's he's saying, I, Job is saying, I don't deserve this because he still views it as a punishment. He doesn't understand. And that's where I think a large part of his wrestling back and forth is happening is that he doesn't understand because he knows that he's innocent but what he's enduring he perceives as a punishment from God Mm -hmm. so until he's willing to set that presumption aside he doesn't understand yeah at this point Job is still going with the understanding that I must have done something wrong to deserve a punishment but I didn't do something wrong so why am I being punished he doesn't have the concept yet that this is an example to teach other people. And obviously his friends don't have it either. Because his friends are basically saying, you're proving that you're guilty. Once again, which is the same argument they've been having the last 15 chapters. is You did something wrong or you're not going to get punished because only bad people have bad things happen to them. Anyone who's lived more than, you know, six months after becoming conscious of existence should know that bad things happen to everyone. That's how life works. If you've ever been dumb enough to stick your hand on a stove like I was a baby. I was just thinking that. You know that the <laughs> bad things happen to you because that's how sin works. Because you do stupid things. The world has sin in it. We get bad results. That's the result. And so moving on. Uh, in verse 7 it reads, Are you the first man who was born or you were made before the hills? I know some people that look like they were. So <laughs> just saying. Have you heard the counsel of God? Do you limit wisdom to yourself? What do you know that we do not know? What do you understand that is not in us? Both the gray-haired and the aged are among us, much older than your father. So obviously there's no indication of the age of these guys talking to Job. Mm -hmm. It says Job's old enough to have lots of kids, obviously. Mm -hmm. So who knows? He had triplets at some point. We don't know. But when you're living 100 years old, and 80 is not old, you can have lots of kids by the time you're 80. That's just how math works. (laughs) And so this is basically Eliphaz pulling out the old man card. And I've heard it from dozens of people before of saying, you don't know what I know because you're younger. I must be right because I'm older and I have experience. <laughs> Which, um, I, to be fair, no. there is a biblical precedence and understanding that we are supposed to... Bow to our spiritual elders. There are elders, there are people who are spiritually more mature. There's always going to be somebody more spiritually mature than yes, you. Yes, because ultimately you come to Jesus, who is the most exactly. mature. That's how it works. So Yes, we should show respect to those who are older than us. That's really no problem there, but you're not right because you're older. Yeah, that's, that, the, reality. that's the issue, is that Eliphaz is basically, at this point, not only saying, you know, you you are just rambling and babbling and not saying anything useful because you are guilty, but now he's also saying, and anything you would say doesn't stick to me anyway because I'm rubber and you're glue because I'm really old. <laughs> it's, it's basically like he's taking a three-year-old aside and saying, Stop your tantrum. You don't know anything. Be quiet and do what I tell you. Pretty much. And that's not fair for one thing. Even a three-year-old is going to have some understanding and should be reasoned with as to why they're having a tantrum. To an extent. Yes, to an extent. (laughs) Obviously, they need to stop the tantrum regardless, but there's a reason why they have the tantrum, and that's what he's dealt with. But Job's not throwing a tantrum. He is justified what he's saying. And Eliphaz is just being mean. (laughs) <laughs> and so in verse 11 it goes on are the constellations of God too small for you and the words spoken gently with you why does your heart carry you away and what do your eyes wink at that you turn your spirit against God and let such words go out of your mouth so this goes hand in hand with what I was just saying about him pulling the old man card Is he's basically saying um, 
how dare you talk? You don't know what you're talking about. Why are you making God mad at you? Why would God ever be mad at us? Well, God is mad at sin. He's not mad at us. He has never once been mad at a sinner. He is mad at sin. That's how it works. He loves all of us. It will treat us like we deserve, which is we deserve to go to hell because we sinned. Bit blunt, but it's reality. But but God has grace and mercy on us that we get by being saved by Jesus Christ. Exactly. And so we don't deserve to go to hell because God's paid the price already for us. But if we haven't accepted that, we still deserve to go to hell because so, we rejected. Okay, so just to so make that even more confusing. We can get a lot worse than that. In the New Testament, it's very clear that every human being deserves to go to hell. That's what we deserve. That's what we've earned because of our sin. But because of God's grace and love for us and his mercy, he has provided a way that we don't have to endure that punishment. We don't have to be condemned. And it's not that we're special because we are saved or anything like that. Being saved simply means you've accepted the gift that God has already given. Jesus already died and paid the price for every single human being. A long time ago. A long time ago. And the only difference between someone who is going to heaven and someone who is not is that the person going to heaven has acknowledged their sin and accepted God's grace through the sacrifice of Jesus taking our place. And the fact of how miserable and abominable you are, which we're going to get to momentarily. Anyway. So in verse 14, it goes on, What is man that he could be pure, and he who is born of a woman that he could be righteous? If God puts no trust in his saints, and the heavens are not pure in his sight, how much less man who is abominable and filthy, who drinks iniquity like water? So this basically is his big foreshadowing, which he doesn't realize he's doing, saying, there's a Savior coming. And it's already been promised in Genesis, which I don't know if he knew or not, but it's recorded as being hundreds, thousands of years early. Mm -hmm. We don't know, just earlier. And it's said that the Savior is going to be born of woman and will be a man. So yeah. he pretty much just says, how can this be that someone is going to be perfect when they're a human? When? Well, Jesus was perfect, is perfect, and forever will be perfect. And he was born of a woman. 100% human and 100% God, which yes. mathematically doesn't make any sense. God but mathematically it does. Huh? I think that's, that's one of those things. We created the concept of mathematics so that we could understand well, the God world around us that God created with a word. Like the Fibonacci spiral and even just the way the stars move. And obviously now we know that the stars aren't technically moving. But anyway, it's just... Oh, they're moving. I just Earth's sometimes flat. I think humans, we get very arrogant and very puffed up and even in this I think Eliphaz is being very puffed up because I don't know that he's even consciously thinking about the savior that was promised but he's thinking I think he's thinking of just himself yeah of himself like, like well this is what verse. I know this is what I understand and how could this be anything else than what I know because I'm old and must know everything that's pretty much what he's saying Okay, so next verse, in verse 17, it reads, I will tell you, hear me, what I have seen, I will declare. What wise men have told, not hiding anything received from their fathers, to whom alone the land was given, and no alien passed among them. So, he, as Emily just said, he's basically playing the old man card, saying, I know what I'm talking about, listen to me. And he's not making any room here for, you know, God to have input. Like to, when, yeah. um, it's kind of a big deal to leave God out of it. <laughs> Since God, the author of it and director of it, sustainer of it, and he's kind, kind of, of the a point. big deal there. <laughs> so if you're ignoring God and missing God, then you're really missing the point, which is what Eliphaz is doing here. And so he goes on in verse um, 20, yeah, 20 right here. And he reads, The wicked man rides with pain all his days, and the number of years is hidden from the oppressor. Dreadful sounds are in his ears, and prosperity the destroyer comes upon him. 
He does not believe that he will return from darkness, for a sword is waiting for him. He wanders about for bread, saying, Where is it? He knows that a day of darkness is ready at his hand. Trouble and anguish make him afraid. They overpower him like a king ready for battle, for he stretches out his hand against God and acts defiantly against the Almighty, running stubbornly against him with his strong embossed shield. So obviously that's a long section to go through at once, but this is really where he's making the crux of his argument, is that bad guys get what's coming to them. They're not happy. They don't get anything nice. And in light of the flood just having occurred, yeah, I guess you can make the argument. Okay. But that was a special circumstance in history that it happened. Because if there was a flood every time bad people rose up, there would be a lot of floods. Yeah. And everyone would have died lots of times. Because right now I'm pretty sure the world is run by people that don't deserve to be in charge. Because they're bad. But, obviously but, that doesn't... Yes, Paul has written that the people who are in charge are there because God has put them there for a reason. He's allowed them to be there. And why it is, we don't know. It's not our job to know. But we know that they will get what's coming to them eventually. It may not be in this lifetime. But the Bible promises are going to hell, so... Yeah. Well, unless they... Bad, unrepentant people will go to hell. Unrepentant being the key. Is that better? <laughs> yes. Thank you. You're welcome. And so we have this here, and he's talking about it, and then he gets to really where people are nowadays, which is the where he stretches his hand out against God and runs defiantly, acting against the Almighty. That is definitely how people are when they don't want to deal with God. Mm -hmm. And of course, nowadays we have the argument that there is no God. Well, that's just you still saying, I'm God. Yeah. I deserve to be in charge and doing the exact same thing. It's but, still arguing that I'm in control, I'm better, yeah. I'm the best. It's like a toddler saying, you're not the boss of me, crossing their <clears throat> arms and facing the wall. Like, or, you know, you're not the boss of me, and they stomp off and do whatever they want to do. Well, guess what? That usually precedes getting a spanking, or, you know. Or sounds like a teenager. <laughs> There's not much of a difference the, there. The idea is the same, that you're any more people saying, oh, I don't believe in God. Well. God believes in you. It's. And whether you believe him or not, he's still real. He's still going okay, to so, judge you. So the concept of not believing in something and therefore it must not be there is... Oh. Air must not be there. I don't believe <laughs> Well, I, so I if you are so standing fly. on the edge of the Grand Canyon with some friends... I don't believe the Grand Canyon exists. Exactly. And there's fog and no one can see the Grand Canyon, but there's a sign and you know you're standing by the fence. There's the edge of the Grand Canyon. It's exactly and somebody else is like no I don't believe it's there and they take off walking well they're going to be falling to the bottom of the Grand Canyon even though they can't see it and don't believe it's there well I feel like they're walking and it's shaped like this to like hit and bounce oh stop just to be fair <laughs> they're not going to fall to the bottom they're going to they hit part way down and bounce <laughs> that's not what I was going for with that example <laughs> The well, idea is... Eventually they hit the bottom. Huh? <laughs> <laughs> Wants to get stuck in a sagebrush. Okay, anyway, the point being, just because you don't, you claim you don't believe it's there, or you want to convince yourself it's not there, doesn't mean it's not there. God is real. Our world is clearly, it clearly points to a creator Everything about who we are until we are told enough times as children that, you know, we can be the one in charge. Everything just naturally points to there is a, a creator. There's someone we're accountable to. And I don't really know where <laughs> how we got onto this. I'm sorry. Okay, what she means is that just because you don't believe the speed limit being 65 on the interstate through Missoula, You'll still get pulled over and get a ticket if you're going 75 or 85. Yeah. May not happen every time, but you will eventually get ticketed for it. Yeah. Just like if you don't believe in stop signs, you will get pulled over for running through them. Because mm -hmm. the law believes in them and the law is in charge. Mm -hmm. And so God is the law in charge of everything else. So if you don't believe in him, that doesn't change whether or not he's in charge and in control. And it doesn't <clears throat> mean that you're not liable or 
responsible for or guilty of breaking the law. Yeah. Anyway, you Moving on. pejorative <laughs> all of us. Yes, we're very pejorative. Us them. <laughs> us we are. Moving on. <laughs> yes. Verse 27. Though he has covered his face with his fatness and made his waist heavy with fat, he dwells in desolate cities and houses which no one inhabits, which are destined to become ruins. He will not be rich, nor will his wealth continue, nor will his possessions overspread the earth. He will not depart from darkness. The flame will draw out his branches, and by the mouth of, or breath of his mouth, he will go away. So this is the, yeah, it kind of is true part, but it really isn't in today's life. Now, if he's talking about spiritually, which he's not talking about because he didn't define as such. If he's saying spiritually, then yes, this is without a doubt accurate. This is exactly 100% what's going to happen. But he's not talking about spiritually. He's talking about actually being rich and having money. And so who are the richest people on this planet? People with land, possessions? People who act deceitfully and take advantage of people. Oh, well, yes. And they have lots and lots and lots and lots of money. Like they could buy a country. Or multiples. And to be fair, we gave them their money. Most of it during the last three years. But for these people, they're not bound by morality. They're not bound by doing things that are right or proper or anything else. Even the law doesn't necessarily apply to them when they do things. It's how much money do I have to pay to make the problem go away? And that's really how the world works. And that's because Satan is in charge of this world. And so if what Eliphaz is saying here was accurate, then there wouldn't be such a thing as former professional football player murders his wife and her lover and gets off scot free. free. Not that we're mentioning any names. Though it was obvious mm -hmm. at the time. Yes. Or so and so steals state secrets and posts them on the internet and then runs away to a different country and gets off scot free. That wouldn't happen because they would be punished immediately. But the reality is that these things do happen. They get out for free because this world is run by sin. And there'll be time when it's not because God's going to come back and he's going to stop it. But for the time being, sin runs rampant and really is in control. I, I think it seems like, sorry, on that last page, it seems like Eliphaz is kind of, again, pointing out specifically what's happening to Job. Mm -hmm. So, though he... Uh, though he is fat, so the fatness and the fat around his waist. The point is, he's talking about him having plenty of food, and he's not, you know, starving. Um, and I, I don't know. It just seems like his house is gone. His his wealth is gone. Are gone. His, wealth his, gone. his possessions are gone. Are gone. His family. He's so in his the darkness. Flame will dry out. His branches. Branches generally. Doesn't that the mean kids are dead. offspring? Basically, he brought ruin upon himself and his whole family paid for it. Basically. So yeah, he, again, was kind of poking at Job again, like... He's still playing the old man card. Of saying, all these things are happening because you... You don't, you're okay. Yeah. Pay attention to what I tell you. <laughs> It's not over. And so at the end here, he says, let him not trust in futile things, deceiving himself, for futility will be his reward. That sounds very f similar to what Solomon says later on, because Solomon chased lots of futile things. But then he will be accomplished before his time, and his branch will not be green. He will shake off his unripe grape like a vine, and cast off his blossom like an olive tree. For the company of hypocrites will be barren, and fire will consume the tents of bribery. They conceive trouble and bring forth futility. Their womb prepares deceit. So that's all sorts of fun there. So he's basically saying that everything prosperous is going to go away from whoever is deceitful. Mm -hmm. And they're not going to have any offspring. They won't have any friends. And they're just going to sit around and indulge them and scrape themselves with pot shirts. Well, he's basically accusing Job of being all those things. Yes. And the reality here, obviously, is that... Hypocrites have lots of friends because they're popular, because they're hypocrites. Because they tell you what you want to hear and not what reality is. They may not have good friends. 
but yeah, they can good ones. they can be surrounded by people who just think that they're the most amazing thing on the earth. But yeah, like actors or politicians. <laughs> of course, everyone's a hypocrite in some way, shape, or form. So you can't really, you know, call that pot. Pin it down pot. to yeah. It is. And that's just the way it works. We're humans. We're going to be hypocritical about something. Mm -hmm. But he's flat out saying that all these people are not going to get anything nice because they're bad. Okay, that would be karma. Karma does not exist. Now, do bad things happen to bad people? Well, yeah. Bad things happen to good people all the time. Bad things happen because sin exists. That's the reality of this life. Mm -hmm. And until sin is removed, which it won't be while you know, we're alive. Bad things will continue to happen. So what Eliphaz should be saying is, I'm sorry, Joe. Life sucks sometimes, but God is in control. <laughs> Make the best of it. And get up and stop scraping yourself because that's disgusting. Yeah, yeah, there's not really anything else he can do. Yeah. Obviously, the best thing they could have done is just sit there with him and be quiet. Which they did for a week. And so. then they started talking and insulting him and dragging him through the mud more. And it's not helping him any. So I don't know why they bother doing it. It's, I think it's a point of they're also trying to understand because they perceived him to be as they are, you know, a wise mm -hmm. man, a good man. And so they're trying to make sense of what's happening. Well, and they perceived him as being sinful when in reality he's the most righteous one of all of them. Yeah. And only because he's seeking God, not because he's special in and of himself. Yeah. He's he has no righteous special because he's choosing to pursue God and try and understand what happened and why things are happening the way that they are. Yeah, and there's bumps along the road, but there's always bumps along the road. That's part of being alive. Mm -hmm. Jesus didn't exactly have the easiest life in existence. And the end of it certainly wasn't very pleasant. But it was for us because by going through the worst death possible was the only way for us to have hope for the future like Joe here has. And you just have to look at things in the right perspective. Because yes, bad things happen. It's unfair. God will take care of it in the end. If you trust in God and trust in Jesus as your Savior, then everything will be fine. Even if you starve to death in life, like Lottie Moon did, life's still going to be good because you're going to heaven. Mm -hmm. So does that mean it's going to be fun here? No. Mm, not necessarily, no. Is it fun to stay in a trailer when it's 40 below outside? Mm, not, not really. Not so much. <laughs> but we, but we, God takes care of it. Yeah. God will provide what's needed when it's needed. And that's really what the story of Job is about, is that God's in control and will always provide. And just because something bad's happening is not necessarily your fault. Sometimes God's using his example to other people. Well, and God allows those things to bring glory to him. To bring glory to him. And we have an opportunity to grow closer to God. Every time there's a challenge, every time there's, you know, you're getting you're being treated poorly because of your faith or, you know, it says specifically to suffer for your faith is a huge thing that not to say you should go and try and find ways to suffer for your faith, that but that, <laughs> yeah, it doesn't count. Um, it's, it's a benefit to you because your relationship with God will grow deeper and stronger and you will grow more dependent on him and more Christ-like because you have no choice. You have to lean on him because... Well, Paul specifically goes through yeah. and he says that for you to suffer because you're a thief, that's not a good thing because you deserve it. But if you're going to suffer because of your witness for Christ, that's an excellent thing because then it's Christ who's actually suffering and it's bringing glory to him through it. Mm -hmm. And so that's what we're supposed to do in life is we're supposed to live to bring glory to God, whether it's fun or not. And it freely won't be fun, and it makes us uncomfortable, and it's unpleasant. Mm -hmm. But it's worth it in the end, because what if someone comes to Christ because of your witness? Or dozens of people did. Or hundreds. Or thousands. Or what if it's just one really stubborn person? 
it it's not your job to know it's up to god exactly and and we're going really long so yeah if Emily wants to say something else, <laughs> nope, she'd say I'm, it. I'm good. Because she's good, which I agree with, but not no, just turning around. I'm done talking for the evening. I highly doubt that one. <laughs> okay, so with that, we'll go ahead and pray then before she starts turning around more. So, dear Lord Heavenly, Heaven, we thank you for this day and thank you for being great and mighty God. We thank you for the evidence of Job existing and of the story of his life that we can. Just come to know you better and see how you work through his life and how you continue to work in each and every life around us today. Just ask to use us to bring glory to your name. Just you know, use this video to draw people to you. Just thank you for everything you've done. Thank you for being great, mighty God, and our Father, our Creator, our Sustainer, and our Savior. In your wonderful name I pray. Amen. Amen. All right. Thanks so much for watching and bearing with us. Um, I know it was long, but... We appreciate you. Let us know your thoughts and comments and... Um, and order a really big steak. <laughs> and send um, us pictures. <laughs> anyhow, um, let us know your comments and thoughts in the description. Not in the description. In yes, the comments. in the description. And... That means you have access um, to our channel. Maybe share this video with a friend. Let us know what they think. And order a really big steak. <laughs> so you can out eat Emily. I couldn't finish my supper. So. She ate like a quarter of a steak. It was a really big steak. Mine was almost double the size of hers. So. Anyway, thanks so much for watching. Bye. Order steak. <laughs>